Since the dawn of time, man has made myth. Ever since humans have been able to look up at the stars, down at the stream, across the mountainous plains or around the living, breathing forests that surround them and ask why, how. Stories have sprung up to explain our position in the world. We know myth has meaning in the way dreams have meaning, in the way that story has meaning. Indeed, Lauren Isley said that man's memory is long when encoded in myth. Myth has meaning, narrative and story harbour meaning. Joseph Campbell, whose hero with a thousand faces is the textbook to this lecture series, said the myths are public dreams and dreams are private myths. The stories we tell ourselves and others are significant. They hold the keys of how best to live and they usually start with a call to adventure followed by a great journey full of trials and tribulations. In the process of slaying dragons, battling armies, cutting oneself out from the belly of a whale and saving the princess, a hero is forged. But how can we be the hero of our own lives? What quest can we undertake? What treasure can we find? What do we truly seek? Let's start by asking what it really means to go on a journey. Now, indeed, when we look at myths across the world, the global myths, myths from different cultures, we can see startling similarities, which is very interesting. Now, how do we get to the heart of the matter, the kernel, the center, and expand outwards? How do we find out where those similarities first arose? Where do we even begin? Are myths collective unconscious and universal imagination, or are they Chinese whispers? I often begin by looking at etymology. If you want to look at how something entered the common imagination, we can look at the words that we use every day. We do not examine our language near, anywhere near close enough. Its meaning is embedded in language, the history of a word. Etymology is the DNA of language. And what you'll find very often is when you look up the etymology of these words that we use commonly, that we use every day, that we think we know the meaning of, that we use in debates and then get angry because we don't think the other person, the opposition, agrees with us or not. These huge words that are signifiers of the human condition, war, peace, love, jealousy, anger, we can go on and on. Any word that you've used frequently over the last few weeks, maybe the last few months, note it down and search out where it originated from, search out what language it originated from, search out what meanings are now obsolete, are now archaic. We still possess the meaning of those words without even really realizing it. So when we talk about going on a journey, of course, we often use journey as a metaphor, an extended metaphor. If you go and read the old sermons of John, John Donne, if you go read his sermons, you'll see that he employs extended metaphors that are really compelling. One extended metaphor that he favours, and indeed all the great poets favour, is the extended metaphor of a journey. If you're trying to sell yourself in any situation, university entrance, job interviews, indeed just persuading anybody for any reason, if you want to be compelling, you start by talking about a journey that you have undertaken, a journey you're about to embark upon, or a journey that you have embarked upon and what you've learned. Journey is wrapped up in story and story is compelling. If you want to persuade somebody, tell them a story with a beginning, a middle and an end and conflict. Lots and lots of conflict. What's conflict? You want something and something standing in your way. There's an obstacle. Not only do you want something, and this is conscious, but you also need something. And very often your need is unconscious and conflicting with your ostensible wants. So you go out in the big wide world, this character that you are, on your adventure, 
on your, on your journey, on your story, to sally forth, to start slaying monsters and battling demons and traversing oceans. And you want something, a pot of gold, treasure, to rescue someone, to save a city from being terrorised. You will learn things on the way as impediments come up to hamper you, to stop you, perhaps even to destroy you. Destroy you physically, spiritually, emotionally, destroy your morale and bring you down. Growth is painful. Spiritual growth is extremely painful. If you are hurting, if you are suffering right now, you might be in a growth period. Few people think of it like that. Oh, I'm in pain right now and I want it to be over. Well, be thankful for your pain because you're on a journey and you're going to learn something from this pain. But what journey are you on and what does journey even mean? If we look at the etymology of journey, it goes back to the old French, journée from the 12th century. Um, and it essentially comes from the French, the old French meaning. Uh, it does mean travel, but it also means day and it means a day's space or a day's travel. It can mean work and employment as well. If you go back to the Italian and the Latin uh, and, um, you know, the medieval old French, it has that sense of a day embedded within it. It's now obsolete, but it's all about a day's travel. And indeed, from the 13th century, it was known as an ordinary day's travel, the distance usually travelled in a day, and that measure of distance was usually estimated to be about 20 miles. Think about that, 20 miles. We can all do 20 miles. We're herd animals. We're, we're designed to traverse great plains at great length. We would actually, we, the, the way we would get food, evolutionarily speaking, was we would just outlast the animals. Of course, there were animals that were faster than us, stronger than us, but we can just go and go and go for days. We can walk for days. Think about a marathon. Yeah, a good time for completing a marathon is about three hours. Um, a day's journey. So when we talk about a journey, you should think about it in terms of what Dale Carnegie referred to as day-tight compartments. Don't worry about tomorrow. There's a Jesus parable in there, and we're obviously going to get into Jesus. Um, there's a Jesus parable in there. Let tomorrow take care of itself. Just worry about today. Journeys can seem insurmountable. The quest can seem too big for us. People procrastinate on their dreams. They procrastinate on their mission, their personal mission, embarking upon something that's greater than them, that's going to be rewarding to them, that's ultimately going to help their surrounding community because it seems too big. And of course, it seems too big. When we look at these great big books about quests, Chaucer's Canterbury Tales, if we look at Don Quixote, they're very big, aren't they? They're big, thick, books and that's for a reason because there's many adventures maybe many perilsome adventures take place in these these books about quests and journeys and travels and if we had to do the whole quest in one gulp right off the bat of course nobody would would ever embark upon a quest because nobody could ever complete it successfully you would ruin yourself even embarking upon it or attempting to it would be impossible but quests are built up on the small unit of days, day-tight compartments, day by day. And if days seem insurmountable to you, if one day as a unit is too long, you can then subdivide it down into hours and segments of the day. Day by day, we journey across life. Time affords us the ability to look back over the past, over past completed quests and see disparate events, often separated by years, strung really quite close together. If we look at uh, All the World's a Stage, it's the beginning of a monologue from William Shakespeare's As You Like It, spoken by Jacques. He said, all the world's a stage and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances. And one man in his time plays many parts, his act be in seven ages. At first, the infant, mewling and puking in the nurse's arms. Then the whining schoolboy, with his satchel and shining morning face, creeping like snail, unwillingly to school. And then the lover, sighing like a furnace, with a woeful ballad made to his mistress's eyebrow. You can go through the whole speech 
um, by yourself and read it aloud and enjoy it. And you can see Shakespeare divides the ages up. We have stages and epochs and seasons in our life. So we're talking about day tight compartments, what can get achieved in a day, what we can do in a day that's going to feed into the whole, but maybe also some cognizance, some recognition of what season in our life we're in. Seasons, hey, it might be different for you. Seasons for me come in cycles of maybe three or four years. Be familiar with the season you you find yourself situated in. And very often seasons might look almost like the seasons of the natural world. You might be in your autumn and then you might get a second spring. You might be in the summer. You might be in the winter. And what you do on a day-to-day basis and what your personal mission is, what your long-term personal mission is, what you hold dear, what you cherish, your personal values and your vocation feeds into what you might do in that particular season in your life. And when we think about daytight compartments, we're going to return to this idea of Buddhism regularly. Because in Buddhism, there's this idea that the one contains the many and the many contains the one. Philosophical and poetic thinkers from all over the world, even those who would have had no knowledge of the Eastern texts, they couldn't possibly have had knowledge of the Eastern texts, are aware of this concept of the one containing the many and the many containing the one. One conversation with your partner contains the many. It makes up the fabric of your entire, the entire landscape of your relationship with them. The same with your children, your parents, your friends, your business partners, your associates. What the one contains the many and the many contain the one. The food that you eat today in the here and now The one contains the many and the many contain the one. Blake, if you read his Auguries of Innocence, he got got this. He said, to see the world in a grain of sand and a heaven in a wild flower. Hold infinity in the palm of your hand and eternity in an hour. One grain of sand contains all the beaches of the world. It's infinity in the palm of your hand, eternity in an hour. That's why we read Proust. He seems to be really slow, doesn't he? But time is all around you in Proust. And labouring over a segment of time contains all of time. And Proust is a journey in himself. Why do we read the great books? Why do we read poems like Child Roland? Why are we reading Don Quixote, Siddhartha? What, indeed, what are they searching for? Proust reveals to us the truth eminent that it's the journey itself. The journey itself is instrumental. So when you embark upon a journey, you are not, of course, you're always, you're always trying to progress to an end point. But there is no happiness there. There's no contentment there. And if there is, it's very short lived. One must continually remind themselves to enjoy the stage of the journey that they're on. And we're going to see this in The Hero with the Thousand Faces. There's a template that we're going to look into. Um, The first part of the hero's journey is the call to adventure. And this usually arises by virtue of a blunder or a Freudian slip. We'll look into this. Basically, a mistake happens that wakes one up at least partially enough to make them realize that their current situation is not the best situation. They need to do something more. Maybe they go into the forest. There's another part of the journey. Usually, or very often, the hero or prospective hero will refuse the call. How <laughs> how relatable is that? The refusal of the call to adventure. Adventure is calling, and you fear it. You fear what might lie ahead. And I'm reminded again of a quote from Joseph Campbell, who says, The cave you fear to enter, holds the treasure you seek. We're going to look at our dreams, and we're going to look at archetypes, we're going to look at Jungian psychology, collective unconscious. I had a dream once that I had a monkey on my back. In my waking life, I was going through some trials and tribulations. I was distressed and depressed. And I had a monkey on my back in this dream. And if you think about it, We can look into the metaphors that we live by, by George Lakoff, because metaphors and cliches, analogies, things that enter common parlance, proverbs, old wisdom, contains wisdom. 
Wisdom that we overlook often at our peril. We say, I've got a monkey on my back. Where on earth did that come from? What part of our primitive, embedded, far back, ancient, unconscious did that get encoded into? I've got a monkey on my back. It means there's a problem. And I was terrified in this dream. This shrieking monkey digging his claws into my flesh. And only... Uh, there was a part of the dream where I didn't want to even acknowledge the monkey. I was trying to get away, but it was on my back. And then the dream took a real pivot because I turned around and I grabbed that monkey and I looked it right in the face. And for a split second, you could see his fangs. You could see his face contorted into anger and fear, rage, hostility. And then his face shrunk. He dwarfed in size. When we look at the thing we fear, it drops in size and stature and significance. The cave you fear to enter holds the treasure you seek. So we might refuse the call to adventure, but that's all the more reason to embark upon it. We'll, we'll go into detail with, with the template, but you've got the call to adventure. You've got the refusal of the call and you might have a bit of a, an aide, a friend or, or someone with supernatural powers, a teacher who helps you on your way, helps you on your way so you can cross the, th the first threshold. And once you've crossed that first threshold, you have to go into the belly of the whale. We can see this with tons of stories, especially the stories that are most evocative, that have most indelibly impressed themselves upon the culture. Star Wars is one of them. Harry Potter is another. Lord of the Rings is another. Alice in Wonderland. We can go on and on. So you're in the belly of the whale, and this composes the part of your adventure known as the departure. Then it's initiation, and you meet a road of trials. You meet a goddess. You meet woman as temptress. Maybe you atone with the father. And then, once you have battled valiantly and you've somewhat succeeded you return. And maybe you refuse to return. Um, maybe you need to cross a threshold upon returning. But when you return, and very often, the end of your journey is where you begun, and you go around in a circle. You go around in a circle. And where you are right now is where you're going to end up, but you'll be here with more insights. Whatever insights you need right now. Maybe you need to learn to love yourself. Maybe you need to learn to love others. I'm not here to say what your adventure is. What is the thing that's bigger than yourself that you can get passionate and committed about? Joseph Campbell. Again, great teacher, great student of human nature. Studied myth endlessly, like James Fraser in The Golden Bow. He told us all to follow our bliss because if we follow our bliss, our happiness, our passion, the universe will open doors for you where before there were only walls. In fact, those walls, you can either smash them down or fashion them into, into some doors. He told us to find the place inside where there's joy and the joy will burn out the pain. Our goal in life, says Campbell, is to make our heartbeats match the beats of the universe to make our nature with nature and often that means we have to return to nature friedrich nietzsche studying the ritualistic choric elements of greek plays we're going to look into ritual because very often people mistake the metaphor for the meaning mistake the allegory for what the allegory is actually trying to teach you myth is a great way to encode meaning and pass it down orally through the ages so that it's remembered. Unfortunately, the true meaning is not really remembered. The true meaning, if we look at it, if we take, for example, the dying and resurrection motif of pagan mythology, yeah, Jesus was died and resurrected, but we can look into that myth. We can look into his story and see the parallels, almost word for word parallels in regards to Dionysus, Adonis, Osiris, Attis. We can go on and on. These are fertility rituals. And it's about praising the sun. We've lost that. We must praise and bless the sun and be grateful for it. Because every day it rises and every day it brings life to the crops. Primitive man would have respected the sun. But now we praise, or no longer because since Nietzsche's dictum, God is dead. We used to praise the son of God in Christian cultures. But Nietzsche, talking about the ritualistic choric elements of Greek plays, said that there's an overwhelming feeling of unity that leads back to the heart of nature. This is the essence of Shakespearean 
comedy. You go into the forest, you escape the city. Maybe you go a bit mad, you get wooed in the wood. Maybe you get a bit frenzied, maybe you get a bit drunk, maybe you fall in love. Maybe you fall in love with an ass. <laughs> Midsummer Night's Dream, fantastic play. Nature has healing properties. So very often in these quest narratives, nature holds the key. Rivers and forests hold the key to meaning. That's where we can find our salvation, in the, in the stillness of nature. And as Fraser said, even the savage cannot fail to perceive how intimately his own life is bound up with the life of nature and how the same processes which freeze the stream and strip the earth of vegetation menace him with extinction. So we erected rituals to convey meaning. Think about the rituals associated with water throughout all the dominant religions of the world. Why is it so soothing to get into water? The healing properties of water probably have less to do with the mineral content and more to do with the return to the womb, return to a lower frequency. A lower frequency of breathing and living is meditative. Why is water so entangled with this idea of transmutation? Look at, the, look at the language of baptism. And look at language itself. Myth is language. What mythology does in a psychoanalytical sense is to give a language to universal desires. We can look into Freudian analysis. He thought that we sublimated our desire through dreams, through mythology, and through plays, plays like Hamlet. The language of mythology, dying and rebirth, and we'll talk about that because very often when we descend to a subterranean world, when we venture into Hades, hoping to return, when we die and death is so entangled with sleep and meaning, pregnant with meaning, we descend into the cave, the subconscious cave, so that we can arise with insights. The language of these elements, dying and rebirth and so on, that it speaks to the common desire of man to progress and for the seasons of life to continue their cycle. Jung, writing in The Psychology of Rebirth, says that the mere fact that people talk about rebirth and that there is such a concept at all means that a store of psychic experiences designated by that term must actually exist. So let's embark upon this journey together our journey into myth, our journey into the great books. You've already embarked upon that one. You're already well into it. You've received the call to adventure and you've sallied forth. You've crossed the first threshold. We'll explain what all of this means and draw in ample examples from all the different myths and folk tales. You've done that and you're probably right now in the belly of the beast. We're on a journey together. We're definitely on a journey through the great books, but let me know what journey, what other journey are you on? What season in your life do you find yourself? What are you struggling with? What are you wrestling with? Where do you designate meaning? Because meaning is up to us to designate. That's where we find meaning. Very often, journeys, if we read books like Siddhartha by Hermann Hesse, the journey is to find meaning, to alleviate ourselves from suffering. Very often, in the Buddhist sense, to remove desire for anything. What journey are you on right now? What are you struggling with? Where do you find meaning? And remember Ernest Becker's words that at the end of the denial of death, he said that the most that any one of us can seem to do is to fashion something, an object or ourselves, and make an offering of it, so to speak, up to the life force, a drop in the confusion. What's your drop in the confusion? What's your offering up to the life force? It could be it could be something you do in your day to day. It could be how you interact with loved ones. Let us know. Let's stride forth together. Get your sword at the ready. Find yourself a steed. We're heading off. <laughs>